The crime scene provided clues about what happened, but it also left many questions unanswered. The evidence leads investigators in different directions. And to get to the truth, police must rely on the subconscious. We knew the key to solving this case lay close to the victim, but a lot of people would be very surprised at just how close. Midnight in Davenport, Florida. Police dispatcher Cheryl Lewis is late for work. On her way to the station, she passes a broken down car but doesn't realize its significance. Minutes later, a frantic woman races into the station. She's just passed a body lying on the road. The same road that Lewis just drove. Sheriff's officers secured the area. When deputies arrived on scene, they found a van parked off to the side of the road. The lights on, the motor is running. There was also a body on the side of the road with skid marks on his back and skid marks on the roadway near the body. We weren't sure if it was a car accident or potentially a hit and run. It looks like a simple accident until police look closer. Upon turning the body over, we found three gunshot wounds to his chest. This was not an accident, but a homicide. Sergeant Connolly calls for backup. FDLE agent Tommy Ray. Okay, what we got? When we searched the crime scene, we found a tire jack and a license to an Alvin Johnson, which we compared it to the registration of the vehicle, and it was a match. Find anything inside the van? We found in the van a uh, 45 handgun that was on the dashboard. But was it the same gun that put the bullet holes in the victim? To find out, the gun is sent to the lab. We also dusted the van for fingerprints to see if we can link a suspect to a crime. And it's not long before a suspect appears. As deputies were secured in the crime scene, they observed a white male subject that appeared to walk out of the woods. As the deputies approached the subject, the subject attempted to flee. After a short chase, he was apprehended and brought back to the crime scene. The man's name is Daryl Rusk, and he claims to live close by. The fact that Daryl stated that he lived in the woods and that he was at the scene itself when the scene happened, of course, was suspicious. While Rusk says he was not involved in the crime, he claims to have heard something. Daryl stated that he heard three gunshots and heard someone scream, you bitch. He then heard tires screeching and heard a vehicle leaving the scene. But to Agent Ray, it doesn't add up. He orders a search of Rusk's house. We went to Daryl's residence and nothing of uh, evidentiary value was found at all. Police next check Rusk himself. We performed a gun residue test on him to see if, in fact, he had possibly fired a firearm. The results are negative. Daryl Rusk is no longer a suspect. But there's someone else who may be able to help. Police dispatcher Cheryl Lewis. Cheryl Lewis stated that she was running late for work. And once she turned off to the state road where later the victim was found, she saw a disabled vehicle. She saw two white females there. Uh, they stated that uh, they didn't need any assistance, and Cheryl went on to work. And it wasn't the white van police found at the scene. This means there were two cars. Could the dispatcher have seen the killers? It was just awful strange that she would have seen this vehicle. Uh, then within 10, 15 minutes later, someone in the same spot had been ran over. The dispatcher doesn't remember enough to move the investigation forward. Agent Ray calls the victim's family to report Alvin Johnson's death. 
He then makes another call, this one to criminal profiler Dale Hinman. Based on what the dispatcher saw, we thought the broken down car may not have been disabled at all. And when Hinman reviews the crime scene photos, she comes to a startling conclusion. The more we look at the details of this case, the less it looked like he was set up to be robbed, and the more it looked like he was set up to be murdered. But who sprung the trap? Alvin Johnson has been killed in Davenport, Florida, and there are no suspects. Criminal profiler Dale Hinman joins the investigation. The fact that the police dispatcher may have actually seen the offenders was very encouraging. It was important to visit the crime scene with her statement in mind. Yeah, right here is where the van was parked. It was uh, running with the lights on. Right over here is where the victim, uh, Alvin Russell Johnson, was found in the middle of the road. Can you tell me something more about the victim? He worked at Circus World. He was a bear trainer. And this would have been the route that he would have traveled from Circus World back to his home in Davenport. Dale moves on to the witness, Daryl Rusk. What did the witness say when you interviewed him? The witness who lived over here said that he had heard three gunshots and he heard uh, someone holler, you bitch. What did the dispatcher say she saw when she arrived here at the scene? She said she saw the disabled vehicle park right over here. Had the flashers on, she saw two females standing by the car. So the fact that you have the dispatcher saying that she sees two females and then the witness hearing the victim yell, you bitch, it sounds like your shooter is going to be a woman. Another interesting aspect of the crime is that the killer did not appear to select the safest place to commit the murder. This was a pretty high-risk crime for the offender in this case because if the dispatcher drove by, somebody else could have driven by during the time that they were stopped here on the side of the road. But maybe the offenders weren't expecting anyone else on this quiet road. The timeline of events suggests a trap. You know, the victim still had his wallet. And he still had the money, his credit cards on him. So we're dismissing uh, robbery as a possible motive. We believe this was a setup. Maybe the car wasn't broken down at all. And if you have the two young women there, then it looks like one of them was the shooter and one of them could have been the getaway driver or the lookout. Investigators established that there may be two offenders. But what about the gun found in the victim's van? We recovered the uh, 45 caliber semi-automatic mm -hmm. from the victim's van. Uh, we've got the projectiles that was recovered from the victim that's over at the FDLA crime lab. The question at the lab is whether the bullets in the victim match the gun in the van. Ballistics expert Kara Tallman has test fired a number of weapons looking for a match, and she may have an answer. I received the bullets from the body, and I have measured the bases. And they fall within what we call the 38 caliber class. I'm going to test fire the 45 auto that was collected from the vehicle, and I'm also going to test fire a 357 Magnum for you to show you the difference of calibers. First, Talman fires the 357, then the 45. And the results are crystal clear. As you can see, the caliber of the bullets that were recovered from the body are more consistent with a 357 Magnum and not the 45. We now knew that the murder weapon was a 357 Magnum, but we didn't know the motive. We were hoping that the victim's family or his co-workers could shed some light on why Alvin Johnson was murdered. Police start with Mrs. Johnson. A victim's wife stated that she awoke around 1.30, 2 o'clock. He wasn't at home. Uh, she just assumed at that time that he had gone to check on the bears. Ms. Johnson, she stated that her daughter, uh, Lisa French, uh, was spending the night with a friend of hers by the name of Pam Dill. In, in doing follow-up on Mrs. Johnson, uh, we found there was no life insurance policy, no motive or any reason that she would have had uh, to have committed this crime. The victim's wife is cleared. But if Johnson went to work the night of his murder, perhaps his colleagues at Circus World may have seen something. You know, in speaking with his co-workers, we found that uh, he was a loner and he wasn't the type that would usually stop to assist someone. 
He always had uh, at least one or two guns with him at all times. Why is Johnson always armed? Police learn there's a reason. We determined that a subject by the name Charles Pridgen had made threats toward Johnson in the past. Charles Pridgen had attempted to date Lisa French on several occasions, and Johnson uh, forbid him to see uh, Lisa or be around the family. Police now have their first good lead, or so they think. In doing a background investigation on Charles Pridgen, uh, we found that he was already in prison. Detectives were ready to dismiss Charles Pridgen as a suspect in this case because they found out he was in prison. But then they received a letter with detailed references to this crime. When law enforcement receives letters like this, the author often tries to remain anonymous. But not this time. The author of the letter stated that his assassins had killed the wrong person, that they were to have killed Lisa and her mother. We found the author of the letter to be Charles Pridgen. Charles Pridgen is in jail, but could he have orchestrated Alvin Johnson's murder from inside? Alvin Johnson has been murdered, and police have a solid lead, Charles Pridgen. Pridgen wrote a long and rambling letter to the detectives, taking credit for Alvin Johnson's murder. But to kill Alvin Johnson from jail, Pridgen would need an accomplice. Detectives were looking for someone that Pridgen had contact with before the homicide, someone who could have committed this crime for him. And because the witness heard a man's voice say, you bitch, we thought that person would be a female. And police records may point investigators in the right direction. In checking the jail log, we found that the only person that had been to see uh, Charles Pridgen prior to this homicide was in fact his sister. But could they have planned the murder together? She did state that she had visited Charles in prison and that had informed Charles that Alvin Johnson hadn't been shot and ran over. But that's where her connection to this crime ends. She claims she was at work the night of the murder. She denied any involvement. They were able to verify her alibi as well as determine that she wasn't involved. A promising lead has vanished into thin air. Police brief Agent Hinman on the latest developments. Here's a copy of a letter that Charles Pridgen sent to Lisa from the state prison. Do you think that he has the contacts that he could arrange this type of homicide from where he is? I don't think so. Charles had a definite obsession with Lisa. He just wouldn't let go. And because Pridgen was obsessed with Lisa, it would make sense that he would write a letter like this so that he could have some control over her family and continue to torment them. So there's a possibility that this letter is just a hoax or something that's designed to send the sheriff's office in a different direction. But it's the offender's behavior that also intrigues Agent Hinman. The crime just seems so personal that he's shot more than once and that he's run over at the scene. So evidently, someone thought maybe they had reason to kill the victim, Johnson, and lured him out to the scene. Does this suggest a connection between the offender and the victim? Well, given that he always carried the gun with him, I think it's unusual that he got out of the van that night and approached somebody on the side of the road without bringing the gun with him. Perhaps he felt very unthreatened by whoever it was that was standing in front of the vehicle, and that's part of the reason why he didn't take his gun with him. It definitely was someone that knew his travels, knew where he worked at Circus World, and knew that was possibly, or would be the main route that he would take in returning home. And there's someone else who drove the exact same route the night of Johnson's murder, the police dispatcher. Police believe Cheryl Lewis's memory may be critical, if they can tap into it. Hypnosis is a tool that's available to law enforcement. We thought the key to developing new leads in this case may lie within the subconscious of Cheryl Lewis. The dispatcher stated that she felt there was something that she just couldn't recall, that there was something in the back of her mind. So we decided at that time to place her under hypnosis and see if we could bring out any of the details that she may have suppressed. 
As Lewis falls into a trance, a police sketch artist creates a composite of whatever description she can recover. And from her hypnotic state come stunning new details. The dispatcher added that the girls were young females, uh, anywhere from 15 to 18 years old. Uh, she stated that she saw them standing at the back of the vehicle, and she also recalled at this point that the flashers were on the vehicle. And under hypnosis, Lewis recalls something else. The dispatcher stated that she was sure that one of the young females had on a football jacket that had the letter H on it. Agent Ray knows what H stands for. And the fact that Haines City High School was right next to Davenport where the crime occurred, we thought there's a strong possibility that the one of the suspects may be from Haines City High School. If Lewis can make a positive ID. We showed the yearbooks of Haines City High School to the dispatcher. Agent Ray's hunch pays off. As Lewis went through the yearbook, she recognized two faces, Lisa French and Pam Dill. Lisa was the victim's stepdaughter, and Pam was Lisa's alibi for the night of the homicide. The trail leads straight to two high school girls. But did Alvin Johnson's own stepdaughter set him up for murder? Alvin Johnson has been murdered, and hypnosis has narrowed the search to two high school girls, Lisa French and Pam Dill. Investigators track down their new leads, and the suspects are brought to the sheriff's office. Police go over their interview strategy. We found that Lisa and Pam were best friends. They did everything together. Uh, they constantly went everywhere together. Since the original assessment suggested that this was a very personal crime, Lisa would have more of a relationship and potentially more of a reason to be angry or hurt by something that her stepfather did than her girlfriend might. Lisa, you know, being the stepdaughter, it would be very easy for her to lure Alvin out to the scene. It sounds more like that Pam is probably somebody who's gone along with what Lisa has decided and helped her in the crime. Police interview the suspected accomplice first. And it doesn't take long for Pam to crack. But she puts the blame on Lisa. Pam Deal stated that Lisa had made a phone call advising her stepfather, Alvin Johnson, that their vehicle was broken down. She said they turned their flashers on and had taken a tire jack out to pretend that their vehicle was disabled. A short time later, a woman drove by and offered to help. The woman she described was Cheryl Lewis, the police dispatcher. And a few minutes after Cheryl Lewis leaves, Alvin Johnson arrives. And that's when the shooting starts. Lisa pulled a 357 and started firing shots and, in fact, had shot Johnson three times. They then panicked, jumped in the car, and as uh, they're starting to pull off, she, in fact, ran over Johnson. But what about the 357 police have been looking for? Pam Dill's confession leads investigators right to it. They took the gun to an area of Cypress Gardens and buried it in a heavily wooded area there. Police bring Lisa in next and get a shocking response. Lisa and Pam were having a lesbian affair and Lisa had been molested by her stepfather, the victim, since the age of four. He raped me. I'll never forget it because it went on all the way to this time. But Lisa claims it was Pam Dill who pulled the trigger. So she always talking about, why don't we just get it over with? He's just a bad person, and he said nothing but bad. And I was just telling her, Pam, I don't think this is a good idea. And then all of a sudden, she was next to me. And she went boom, 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 like two or three times. And it threw him back. And then he, she shot him again. The lovers have turned on each other, but police are confident they know the mastermind. Because Lisa said that she was abused, we all felt that she was the one that planned and committed Alvin Johnson's murder. And a jury agrees. 
Lisa French is found guilty of murder. Pam Dill agrees to a plea bargain. The ironic part is the fact that Alvin Johnson had given the murder weapon, the 357, to his stepdaughter uh, for protection against Charles Pridgen. And then she turned and used it on him for the alleged abuse that she had suffered over the years. We always believed that this crime was very personal, but we could not predict how personal it would really be. But thanks to the hard work of Special Agent Ray and everyone at the Polk County Sheriff's Office, this case was finally closed.